In this video, we are going to be answering some common questions about using Ableton Live in worship. We are refreshing our lead worship with Ableton course right now over the next few weeks and months. Link in the description if you want to participate in that. And as part of a course refresh, we always survey the church front community. What are your most common questions about this topic? So this video, it's all about these questions concerning using Ableton Live to run a click and tracks and to automate lyrics, lights, and more in worship. Question number one, how much does it cost for a full setup of Ableton Live? How much is the MacBook? $9.99 for base model MacBook Air. Isn't it $8.99? Is it less than that now? Man, I, didn't, I haven't even kept track. It might be $8.99. I can just always find out here on Apple. $9.99 for a base model MacBook Air. Yep, so $9.99 for a base model MacBook Air. Um, and it is sufficient with even eight gigs of RAM. That's what both of us have. These are our yep. daily driver laptops here. We do a lot with them. Um, I've made another video about how well these computers run Ableton. So that, usually an audio interface, it really depends. You could spend $100 on an audio interface, and then you could spend up to $500 on an audio interface. Uh, it depends on how many channels you want. So if you just want uh, two channels of output for like one for your click and guide and one for tracks, you could get an inexpensive Behringer audio interface. We'd recommend having at least four output channels uh, for Ableton Live. So then you can have like stereo tracks and then you can have uh, a channel for click and maybe a channel for guide or you could have a channel for something Percussion, else. Percussion, you know? synth yeah. bass, anything like that. Yep. So there's the cost of the computer and then there's the audio interface, whether that be the Scarlet Focusrite or um, maybe the track rig that has eight outputs from Loop Community or if you already have something like Dante integrated in your setup then the cost of a converter. Yeah, Dante cards are great. I mean, they're about, what, 600 bucks. They're kind of hard to find right now because of chip shortages. But once you have one of those, then you put Dante Virtual Sound Card on your machine, which is, what, 30 bucks? Yeah. And you can get your Ableton outputs to your mixing console over Dante. So it varies. Uh, Ableton Live itself, we recommend the standard version, which I believe is 449. Use that 90-day trial when you first download it uh, just to make sure you like it. It's going to work well in your ministry. So all said and done, I would say between, if you're gonna have a new setup with a new computer, you're gonna probably wanna budget somewhere around, I'd say $2,000 for the computer, the software, and the audio interface. Yep, and that doesn't include the actual multi-tracks. You can get multi-tracks from all sorts of places. Um, those are an additional cost, but that's like a monthly cost. Yep, or you can also just make your own tracks, or you could just run a click and some guide cues in there. Like it's Ableton, one of the things I do like about it is the flexibility of budget that, that, that it has. You don't have to load in tracks or buy tracks from anywhere if you just want your band to play with a metronome and to automate lyrics and light. So you can build all of those sessions yourself. What makes Ableton better than another DAW software? Well, it's Ableton Live. Is built for live use. Yep. So it's it's been the standard for live playback for I don't know how long, but as long as I've known it, I've personally used. I tried to use Pro Tools. I tried to use Studio One and Logic as playback for the tracks for my my band as we as we did shows, and that was before I knew about Ableton Live, and I did have issues like sometimes, but. When I moved to Ableton Live, I have not had any software issues. Yeah, it's like it was a software designed for like music producer, DJ, EDM, electronic yep. music artists, people who would like be performing, you know, with the software live, not just in the recording studio environment. It can be in a recording studio environment, but it definitely was designed with the live performance in mind because there's quite a bit that the software is doing to play back audio files in a reliable way, to be able to jump around your arrangement in a smooth way. Um, Ableton yeah. Live does a lot of those things in a unique way that other DAWs uh, don't do that. Uh, here's a good pretty technical question about Ableton Live. Um, this one says, we use arrangement view and we set markers and mini map them so we can go from bridge to chorus, verse to bridge, et cetera. But it does, but it, does it only after one bar. So that means like if I were if I was in the middle of a bridge and I cue a different part of the song, mm -hmm. it's not going to finish out the bridge before it jumps to the other part of the song. Right. Um, you have to cue something that whatever you want, you got to make sure you cue it usually one, within one bar of when that next next thing's going to come. Yep. Um, so 
this is the kind of the nuance of I think when it comes to like who who's running Ableton Live during your worship set, um, and is is Ableton Live the best tool for you? Like I actually tend to say like if you are really jumping around in arrangement like crazy on Sunday morning, um, and you're doing a song and you're like I want to go sing this verse again, right? And you're a solo worship leader running your tracks rig in Ableton. I would actually probably discourage you from using Ableton because it's really more set up for if you had like a dedicated music director who's calling those shots and operating it. Um, whereas there's other great options like Playback and Prime. Those are simpler tracks playback software. They can automate things as well where they do what this guy's talking about. He says, when we use Prime, it'll change after the bridge, after the verse, when we want to jump to those next song sections. Mm. So I think that's the strength, definitely one of the big strengths of those applications is it'll play through a whole section before it goes to another one. Personally, this is my personal way I play music and lead worship, I, I play the arrangement that we originally planned and wanted it to be at the end of it, then we can be creative. If I want to jump back to a bridge and do the end of the song one more time, we can. It's obviously way easier when we have a dedicated music director or tracks operator who can actually do that in real time. That's how the big churches do it, like Belonging, Elevation. They have a dedicated person playing it like an instrument. So hopefully that gives you some clarity and it even helps you, want, uh, helps you realize whether or not Ableton Live is the best tracks playback rig for your ministry. Yeah. You can, if you wanted to set up, you know, 10 markers for each song ahead of time, you could do that where it's like within one bar, you hit a certain button and it goes to the bridge or to the chorus. And if you have an MD that has a little Ableton push controller with a lot of buttons on it, that's definitely possible, but it takes some prep ahead of time. This is a good question. They asked, do you have a beginner course on how to use Ableton Live, including what equipment and tools that are needed to get started? Yes, that's Lead Worship with Ableton. That is the, the link that you'll find below this video. Go to worshipministryschool.com forward slash Ableton dash live. And we're running a promotion on the course this week. That is our complete from beginner to advanced training on Ableton Live. So we're going to start off the training in a way that we assume that you have never touched Ableton before. You maybe never have had a tracks and automation rigs before. So we, we really break it down into the simple concepts, help you integrate it within your monitoring and your mixing console for the first time. And then we'll show you how to navigate the software. Because when you look at the software, you know, it's kind of intimidating. There's lots of different things it can do. It's a full-on digital audio workstation. But we really help you just focus on what are the essential pieces of the software to make it work for your ministry. So... Yes, we have a course for beginners. Check it out down below in the description. How do I integrate a stream deck or companion with Ableton? Yeah. You just plug it in and you map it. You hit with com MIDI, right? With MIDI. Yep. You hit Command M while you have Ableton open. It makes everything that's possible to control a different color. And then you select that and you press the button. There's a little bit more to it as far as you know, making sure that the device is connected through MIDI, but that can be in the course. Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, there's probably a whole host of cool things you can do with a, a stream deck, right? With all yeah. the different buttons, the way you label it. Let's say you had a, a actual dedicated tracks operator in your band or just your keyboard player was doing it. They could have a stream deck right on their keyboard and play, stop, song one, song two, song three, you know, you can pretty much do all of that and, and control all of it. Maybe they could they could mute tracks if they needed to or yeah. things like that as well. So um, as, if, it, if it's a MIDI compatible device, it can talk to Ableton Live. How to set up Ableton set list for flexibility and flowing in worship. So show them my, my set list right yeah. there. So for the most part, like you said, like I said earlier, like I do have my set list pretty much well set. Our time is pretty much well determined ahead of time of what our service is going to look like. Um, but let's say, you know, we get to um, the end of a song. And this is a good example of what, what I do. It's really just simply a pad and a looping click at the end of the song. Um, usually it's going to be in the same key as that song, the pad, so that, you know, in, in the same tempo, right? So we end the song and then we can just kind of you know, have, have a moment, have one of those worship moments where the keyboardist is playing lightly in the background. I could say a prayer, and then I can just go ahead and sing and repeat a chorus or a bridge or one of the parts of the songs. Um, this actual example here Adam's looking at is a pad and click for the next song. So there's a call to worship happening right there. 
and right after the first song, and we pad in the pads and the click for the next song. So there, there's lots of flexibility. This is probably, because I'm just like a guy who likes to make things as simple as possible. Um, this is how we have it up, set up really simply. But again, I like to, to reiterate, um, if you have a dedicated tracks operator or a music director, then you can do fancier things with this and yeah. jump around a lot more. Um, yeah. For if guys want, like us who are like solo worship leaders most of the time, we don't have a dedicated music director, we pretty much set it, forget it, play through the list, and then have, have looping sections where we need them, and then cue the next song when it's ready to go. Yep. Yeah, if you had someone like playing keys, just sitting backstage doing this, you could add all these cues in and say, okay, I want to be able to go back to this first chorus and like have a predetermined marker that you can set it with a MIDI button if you want and yep. be able to do it in a timely fashion. But yeah, for the way that most people, I think, run it, especially people like us that are just leading from here and need to hit next song, this is how we set it up. Can I use Ableton Live to play backing tracks and simultaneously trigger sounds for our keyboardist? So yes, yes and no. I'm not really sure exactly the, the context you're asking this from. We recommend having two different instances of Ableton Live if you're going to run tracks the way we recommend them in Arrangement View. And then usually when I've seen keyboardists use Ableton Live for their keys sound, um, they're going to use that uh, the session view, like if they use the Sunday Keys template for Ableton Live. Um, or something like that. It's better for them to be two different instances. It's possible. You can still load in patches. I've done it. We've done it before too. We did yeah. it at Mission Lakewood. I, I think you're gonna feel like you have more freedom and flexibility with, as a keyboardist um, when you detach the tracks playback from the keys. Or yeah. in your tracks playback software, you can send automations to your keys uh, Ableton Live. So Or your keys um, main stage or whatever software you're using. Yep. Yep, if it has MIDI, it can talk to and from Ableton Live. How do I make it easy for non-techie worship team members to control Ableton Live on stage? There's a few ways. One way is to just use the simple keyboard commands. So on that set, I think I have the keyboard command set up. If you do like one, two, three, four, it's gonna jump from song one, two, three, four, just with the use of, of the keyboard, right? Um, so that just makes it really simple. And then the space bar is your play button play button. So whenever I used to get Ableton sets up and running for the first time, I usually had it on a stand like this. So get, get some sort of stand for your laptop, put it next to your drummer, whoever's going to cue the songs. I like it when drummers run Ableton yeah. because, I don't know, they're, they're the ones usually in charge of making sure everything is on time the way it's supposed to be. Could be a drummer, could be a keyboardist, could be a guitarist. And then use keyboard mapping, they hit one, play, right? Or and then maybe it loops at the end of a song, and then they know when the person's done praying, all they have to do is hit two because it's already playing, and you're just jumping to that next locator. What's another way you can cue songs? Well, make it easy? like we talked earlier, you could set up a stream deck, mm -hmm. and you could have the text of the stream deck say song one, two, three, four, play and stop. Yep. We use the uh, loop to miss often. It's a foot controller, so it's better for like a guitarist or a worship leader to use that. And you can do the same thing, map whatever button you want to be the number of the songs. Where's the best place to get good quality and expensive tracks? So we talked about this in another video. Um, what, one new resource we found was worshiponline.com. You sign up for their monthly membership and they do have like really inexpensive tracks that you pretty much save, you know, compared to buying tracks other, other places, you, you, you just pretty much, that covers the cost. The savings covers the cost of the monthly membership because yeah. uh, they're recording all these backing tracks for their tutorial videos that they have on the site. So that's a great place. Um, Multi-tracks and Loop community, community are kind of the standard of, of where to get tracks. Loop Community has their premium tracks, which are not the master tracks from the album or the studio, but tracks that Loop Community's studio made. And they're a bit uh, less expensive and they sound awesome. So that you can also just buy uh, like the guide cues and click track track for a lot of these songs yep. too. Like if you just want to like if you don't need backing tracks, maybe you want to just throw some church front pads in there. Have the guide cues all ready to go for the arrangement. Um, you can buy buy that from I think both Loop Community and Multi Tracks. PraiseCharts.com they have tracks yep. as well. I think Worship Tutorials sells them. So there's all sorts of resources out there. You can make your own. Yeah, and then you can make your own, and that's what's cool about Ableton is. When you get the standard version of Ableton, it comes with some of these built-in instruments of percussion, piano sounds, synth sounds, and you can get a little MIDI keyboard or some sort of MIDI controller, and you can start 
you know, making some, some beats and you can put some pads in there. Um, we, we did a lot of that during the pandemic when we yeah. wanted our kind of lighter arrangements of songs and backing tracks. Um, and we wanted to just kind of fit the vibe of that too. So how do you overcome drummers who have never played with a click and tracks? Well, you you don't just throw Ableton Live at them and say, "Hey, we're going to start using tracks this Sunday." You have to do a little bit of onboarding, a little bit of on ramp of, "Hey, start practicing with a click at home. Play along with the song and add a click to it." You can use Ableton to export the guide cues and the clicks and maybe some other like just the MP3 of the song, which is a really handy tool. I've done that for a while, putting those on planning center so they can hear the the track lightly in the background but the main thing that they're hearing is the click and the guide cues so they know it says build two three four you have to start building at that point or if it, they know that the chorus is coming up but having them feel confident playing to a click before you introduce this at a rehearsal or on a Sunday is really key. How do you EQ your tracks for optimal sound quality for your worship service? Most tracks are already like perfectly mastered, especially if, you've, if you're buying them online. So if it sounds like there's EQ problems, it could be just kind of issues you're dealing with, with your PA and, and the acoustics in your room, uh, or just your overall mix. But sometimes, you know, with our tracks um, going into the sound console, we might put, you know, a high pass filter to kind of cut out some unnecessary lows coming from them if we don't want them. Or maybe we might, you know, cut a little bit around the high mids, maybe around the four, five, six K or something like that. If we feel like another instrument or vocal needs to cut through that, the mix a little bit better. Um, so but for the most part, I don't know. I think most of our tracks are EQ'd pretty flat because yep. it sounds good at the source. Right. Another common question, why would you choose Ableton over software like Playback or Prime? I'll let you answer this first. Yeah, I like the flexibility and I don't like being like locked into only being able to use multitracks.com. Uh, sometimes I like the creative freedom to change the song, you know, pull out an instrument, um, put my own recording of a certain type of instrument in there, uh, choose tracks from Loop Community and multitracks or whatever source I want. And you can't do that when you're locked into one ecosystem. I'm a big fan, especially because I run tracks in arrangement view. I really like to see my whole arrangement of a whole service in one view. And you kind of get that vibe with the, with playback in Prime, but it, it, to me, it's it's kind of like they load up each song individually, it cues up each song individually. I'm not really getting that, that overarching view of the transitions that are actually happening and seeing like exactly how those transitions are gonna work beat by beat bar by bar. Um, so that to me, I just really like seeing that this timeline view that you see here on the screen. And then I, the thing about, um, and Adam already alluded to this, like usually if you pick playback or prime, you're really committing to one of those two ecosystems and you get a lot of convenience uh, with that. And it's great to be able to have everything happen in their clouds and you can have multiple iPads and it can all sync. That's really great. Um, and then we even talked earlier about some of the features that are better. Like I think if you like skip around songs like crazy and you don't even know what song you're gonna do and you need to call yeah. something up instantly, I would recommend like something like playback is great for you or prime is great for you because it's like, we joke around. It's like perfect for the unprepared worship <laughs> leaders, yeah. right? Um, but some people, that's their style. They like to be way more spontaneous about it and that can make sense. But for us, like we just like to have the flexibility to have kind of this like, neutral third-party playback software that can get quite advanced because it's a full-on DAW and has a full timeline. We can source tracks from anywhere. Um, we can create our own tracks, create our own workflows and things that kind of work with our personalities and preferences for it. So those are really the reasons. So, yeah. But I'm never going to downplay the value of playback or Prime. Those are also amazing apps and I've, I've seen it work everywhere. We did some polls and right now, of all the people running Click in automation, Ableton is still kind of the, the lead uh, industry leader in this area. And then next is Playback, and then next is Prime. Um, surprising amount of people probably watching this video still don't even use the Click and Tracks uh, yep. at all. But uh, Playback and Prime have come such a long way, and I think there's space for all, all three, Ableton, Playback, and Prime.
Yeah, one other thing that is easier with Ableton Live is the automation piece. So if you're interested in automating your lighting or your pro presenter or your video switcher or your pedal board or your keyboard, whatever it is you want to automate, I think it's easier to do within Ableton mm -hmm. than it is to do within those other softwares. It's just a little cumbersome still. Some of the, I mean, and it depends, right? Because there's yeah. some ways where they've made it easy with playback, you can pull in pro presenter cues automatically yep. and stuff like that. But w what I think I struggle with with those apps is they really make the app's UI designed for simplicity where um, I like the DAW because we can create our templates for all my lighting cues and pro presenter cues. We pull them up in browser and then we just kind of click and drag every week. We just put whatever we want in there. We can save all those automations to individual songs uh, easily. It's just like a it's like a weird workflow preference that I have and a user interface preference um, that I have with these things. So, um, yeah. So that's all the time we have for all of these questions that were sent in. It was actually around like probably like 70 to, to 80 questions that came in via email. So thanks for those of you who took the time. A lot of the questions were actually the same. We tried to hit one of each of the categories or types of questions here in this video. Definitely check out our Lead Worship with Ableton online course, link down below. Like I said, the entire course is already in existence, but we're refreshing all the lessons. Ableton was updated recently. Now it works really well with um, Apple M1 uh, Silicon, and um, we have just better workflows, right? I was the one who designed the first Lead Worship with Ableton course, but now we got Adam's brain to combine with my brain to make it even better training. This dude knows lots of tips and tricks with Ableton Live, um, and I'm really excited for you to take the lead on, on teaching these things. So thanks for watching this video. Let us know what other questions you have about Ableton Live down below the video, either one of our team members or someone from the church front community. I'm sure we'll chime in to help you out with that question. And once again, check out the link to lead worship with Ableton and take advantage of that pretty steep discount that we're offering on the course this week only. See you next time.